thank you a lot. We have matching t-shirts, yes, because uh, I just got the package <laughs> from the global AI community and I'm very, very happy to that. And um, so I'm going to share my screen because I prepared with slides and everything. So um, let me get started. So yeah, I am Eva Party, a software developer and data scientist. I am working in full time at Lerdal. And uh, on the side, I am uh, doing um, a lot of uh, data science and uh, AI related work on my free time. I am talking about my researches and projects, um, uh, but different events and some meetups like now and uh, some conferences as well. And I uh, do a small company as well, where I'm providing uh, mentoring and consultation for companies and students when they want to get started with uh, using data, data modeling and so on. Um, you can find my blog as well. Uh, if you go to the code with eve.azurewebsites.net where you can find uh, most of my projects that I've been working on. It is involving a lot of deep learning, data science and AI related uh, uh, posts. And if you want to connect, feel free to find me on Twitter or write me an email if you have anything to talk about or you need some help with your projects or something. And uh, as uh, Michael had mentioned, I'm also an AI MVP, uh, which uh, now is, it's really, really, really awesome to be part of this community. And, and uh, yeah, I hope I can show you something cool today. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, about, um, you know, in the last few years, artificial intelligence has become more and more prevalent and powerful. And many speeches around AI nowadays explain how new technologies can be benefited to predict stock prices and create value for an organization. And in fact, even online courses meant to educate newcomers in the field are focusing on the financial benefits of AI. In today's materialistic world, I would like to focus on how the very same technologies can be benefited to predict natural disasters and eventually increase uh, survival rates and improve quality of life. The disasters caused by natural phenomena have been present all along human history. Nevertheless, their consequences are greater each time. And this tendency will not be reverted in the coming years. On the contrary, it is expected that natural disasters will increase in number and intensity due to the global warming. According to world statistics, the increase in the number of world disasters between the decades of uh, 1987 and 96 and 1997 to 2006 was 60 uh, percent, going from 4,000 something to uh, 6,800 something, whereas the number of dead people during this uh, period increased 100 percent. That is from uh, 600,000 to more than 1.2 million people died. In the coming years, this tendency will not be reverted. It is foreseen that natural phenomena will increase in number and intensity due to the global warming. More than 9 million Australians have been impacted by a natural disaster or extreme weather even in the past 30 years. And the number of people affected uh, annually is expected to grow as the intensity and in some areas the frequency as well um, uh, continues to grow. And these costs that I'm presenting here uh, this includes significant and often long-term uh, social impacts, including death and injuries, as well as impacts on employment, education, community networks, health and well-being. And uh, humans have been trying to predict uh, earthquakes and uh, natural disasters in, already in the, in the first century China, when there was this um, a vessel uh, fitted with metal dragon faces and it was uh, facing each compass direction like this and they had like a metal ball in their mouth and if the earth was uh, shaking somewhere the ball fell out from the mouth of this dragon and it was somewhat able to it was somewhat able to indicate where the earthquake might be 
there was also uh, some kind of predictions in Greece. I can't remember the, the, the year of that, but in Greece they said that uh, it was actually visible on the animals. The animals were leaving the area where the natural phenomena could be expected. So, you know, some of these predictions uh, actually sounded reasonable. But after some research, uh, those things were concluded to be natural phenomena with little to no correlation to actual earthquakes. AI, however, relies solely on data. Generally speaking, the more data, the better in terms of building a reliable algorithm. And multiple researchers uh, have been uh, creating their own applications to predict earthquakes and aftershocks. And these systems also monitor aging infrastructure as well. So AI systems can detect deformations in structures, which uh, can be used to reduce the damage caused by collapsing buildings and bridges and so on. So during this talk, you will see a real life uh, example of saving more lives with AI, how to examine a natural disaster and how to use that observations to save more lives. So I'm going to show you uh, my motivation first. Uh, how did I get started with uh, earthquakes in Nepal? And uh, I'm going to present you uh, the the whole thing inside Azure Machine Learning Workspace. And I hope in the end of this session, you will have a good understanding how to get started with this tool and that uh, you can actually also save lives with uh, using AI. I'm going to show you a video to get you also in the mood. <laughs> so in April 2015, there was an earthquake with 7.8 magnitude and an epicenter in the Gorka district. The disaster killed almost 9,000 people and injured around uh, 22,000. And this horror was in most cases caused by the collapsed buildings in this earthquake. Many data scientists have been working very hard to improve the survival rate of the next earthquake. And our mission is to build a predictive machine learning model to investigate and understand the risks of damage in case of another natural disaster. The result of our findings is available to mitigate which buildings might need strengthening before another earthquake. By this, not only memorial buildings and homes could be saved, but also thousands of lives. And I have just uh, mentioned uh, bit about uh, data scientists. But let me quickly introduce you what is data science. Data science is really just an umbrella term. It refers to figuring out ways uh, to study and solve problems with data. And to do that effectively, you need a range of skills like computer science, math and statistics, and whatever domain you are in, you have to be expert in that domain. For example, for this project, you might want to understand a bit of architecture and some kind of uh, forecasting of natural disasters. Data scientists are absolutely obsessed with data. The first thing we always do when we have a problem to solve, that we are looking around for all the possible data sources which we can bring to bear on this problem. And then we also have to figure out how do we bring this into some environment, uh, for example, into Databricks or Azure Machine Learning Workspace, for example. And of course, the data never arrives in the shape how you expected, so you might have to spend a lot of time on cleaning, transforming, reshaping, and so on. Then we also need to have a good understanding how the relationships in the data works and uh, you know, what is the data trying to tell us about the problem we are trying to solve? What are the features that are actually useful? And what are the ones that are actually just add noise to the situation? And finally, we're going to do some predictive analytics or modeling. And through that, we hope to deliver uh, value back to our customers or end users, which helps them drive decisions and make them better also. What we want to do is to build a predictive model that is able to answer our big question, uh, which buildings are in danger if another earthquake comes? Which ones are the ones that we might have to apply some strengthening on and, and so on? Predictive analytics deal with uh, designing statistical models or uh, machine learning models that are able to predict. 
what they do is that uh, they're calibrated on past data or experience, you know, or we can call them like features as well. And based on this, uh, so they learn from this and then they are able to predict the future. So we build and train our model by performing something called uh, supervised learning. It is cool, uh, called supervised because it's a, it's a fully managed training and that is uh, including due, it needs you to, to have uh, features and labels as well. I'm going to tell about this uh, as we are going forward. But what we have to do is uh, we have a few steps that we have to take when we are doing a machine learning uh, model. First of all, we have to prepare the data. We have to pull that in and uh, do some transformations, some data cleaning, maybe uh, do some normalization that I'm going to talk about also. I'm showing to you how does it work. Then we might have to do some splitting on the data, prepare it for training and testing as well. Then the next step is to train the model. And in Azure Machine Learning, training a machine learning model starts with uh, choosing which specific algorithm uh, we want to configure or model with. And then uh, both the data set and the algorithm has to be uh, connected with this uh, train model module. And, uh, but we are going to talk about these algorithms a lot and, and you will see how does it work in, in actually uh, in the experiment. So the next step is to score the model. Scoring in, in our case, when we are doing a predictive analytical model, this is called also as a prediction. But we are calling it a scoring because depending on what model you are using or what uh, problem you're trying to solve, it can return different data. For example, it can uh, return a recommended uh, number, for example, like how uh, much will cost this car next year or whatever, or it can uh, return you uh, uh, category or you know whether it is red or blue and and so on so depending on the data you provide and the model uh, you are training uh, that uh, scoring is uh, returning different uh, information and what we have to do then is to evaluate our model evaluation basically uh, returning metrics that tell you how good your model uh, works. For example, in our case, uh, for example, the accuracy uh, could be a good measure how our uh, predictive model works that tells us how well it can predict the future. While working with a predictive uh, model, keep that in mind that it is not always working perfectly for the first try and that uh, you might have to apply some improvements on the data set, your algorithms, and so on. But the best result is the aim, which is why machine learning itself is also, also an improving field. My aim today is really that to walk you through the whole pipeline, to show you how to uh, understand the data, how to do some transformation, and how to then uh, get a good, uh, very well-trained model in the end. What I'm going to show you today is the use of Azure Machine Learning for Workspace, because the whole thing I was just talking about, it might sound like some black magic, but thanks to the tools uh, provided by Azure, uh, you have a really good chance to easily get started with machine learning and learn about the different uh, training algorithms and then understand what the res uh, result might mean. So. The workspace is the top level uh, resource for Azure Machine Learning, providing a centralized place to work with uh, all the artifacts, uh, artifacts uh, you create uh, when, you, when you start using Azure ML. And the workspace keeps history of all training rugs, runs, including uh, some logs, metrics, some outputs, and a snapshot of your script. And then whatever you build, you can then deploy to different environments, such as uh, to some uh, Azure Container Services, uh, Kubernetes uh, Service, FPGA, and also to IoT Edge uh, devices as well as a module. Pricing and uh, features available depending on uh, which uh, version you want to try because there are there's uh, the basic and the enterprise version of uh, this workspace and uh, at this point uh, the basic environment only includes uh, Azure notebooks that you might have heard about before 
and the enterprise, including as the designer. That might be also very familiar for you when you see it, if you have used the uh, Azure Machine Learning Studio before. And there is also something called automated machine learning. And all these three might uh, be something new to you, but don't worry, we are going to walk through on all these three. So this diagram shows the different components of the workspace. And uh, a workspace can contain Azure machine learning notebooks uh, and uh, virtual machines for that. Uh, I just noticed that my mouse didn't want to move anywhere. So that's why I stopped for a second, sorry. But yeah, so these are cloud resources uh, configured with the Python environment necessary to run the Azure machine learning uh, scripts you write. And, um, with the use of user roles, you can uh, also share this workspace with other users or the whole team. And you don't just have to share just one notebook or just one item. You can just share the entire workspace with the whole project in it. Compute targets are used to run your experiment. When you create a workspace, uh, some associated resources are generated for you, as you can see, for example, uh, storage accounts and uh, app insights and so on. And uh, there are these experiments. Uh, these are training runs that uh, you can use to build uh, your models. And uh, pipelines are uh, reusable workflows for training and retraining your model. There are different tools for you to work with when uh, you want to use your workspace. First of all, you can use uh, Azure Machine Learning Studio, of course, that is uh, via the portal. But you can reach uh, from a Python SDK and an R SDK as well, depending on your preferences. And there is also the Azure Machine Learning SDK that you can use to communicate with your workspace. But uh, today we are going to focus on the uh, Azure portal. And uh, for this, I am uh, already go and uh, move to my Azure portal. I hope you can see my screen still. So I, I'm not sure if you have seen uh, the portal before and it's really strange that I cannot see you guys <laughs> nodding or whatever. But uh, so I'm just going to show you how to create uh, this uh, workspace then. So what you can do is just uh, go to create a resource and from the AI and machine learning, you can choose this machine learning here. And then you have to define a workspace name and then choose a subscription where you want to put it. You might want to add uh, the resource group as well. So it is, um, you know, the, the, same, the services in the same resource group could uh, communicate better in the end. You can define where you want to put it. For example, I would put it to North Europe. And then this is where it is interesting. You can uh, choose to go with basic or enterprise. And actually, the good thing about uh, this environment is that if you choose to go with basic first, you can always change it to enterprise as you're going forward. And you just click on review and create. Now I won't create a new one because I have already prepared it for you. Um, so yes, yes, please do that. Yes, yes, yes. I changed my mind. So when the resource is done, then you can go to the dashboard like this, and you can just uh, start up the machine learning studio with the launch now button. And when that is done, you should see the panel like this. And as you can see, as I mentioned to you, you can work with notebooks, automated machine learning, and the designer. So what we are going to do first is that we are going to take a look at the data set we are using for this uh, project. So I'm, gonna, I'm just starting up the notebooks. And if you have ever used uh, this, um, this uh, IPython notebook, this Jupyter notebook before, this might be very familiar for you. I'm just opening up a code that I have written before. And when that is done, you have to notice that uh, here you can uh, define what uh, computation you want to use. You can create your own machine here, whatever you prefer. And you can stop it when you don't use it. It's a very good practice to stop it, actually, if you don't want to use it because it actually costs some money. <laughs> I, I keep forgetting stuff in that. Anyway, what you can do now is that uh, just go and uh, try and edit it in here, or you can export it to a local uh, Python notebook. 
So the data we are going to use um, for uh, prediction is coming from the Central Bureau of Statistics. And this uh, collection is based by um, based on uh, the you know, collapsed buildings in the past earthquakes in Nepal. Um, so this is going to be our training data set that we are going to use. Uh, and while building the predictive model, it is really important to understand what features are useful for us and what are the ones that we should just leave out. And this is what is going to be our aim now. So what I'm doing is that I am just uh, reading in the values and labels. Why am I doing that? Because when it is a supervised uh, machine learning model, then we have to provide a label as well for the features. And that would look like that after joining and writing it all out. Then we will have a column called damage grade as uh, the label for our data set. And the uh, display function can also give us an information about uh, how many um, rows and columns we have in the data set. I'm just going back in the beginning. So we have around uh, 260,000 uh, rows and 39 columns. So, yes. Um, yeah, I mentioned to you that, yes, we have the features and labels. So let's take a look at the labels a bit uh, more detailed. So um, here, as I'm, I hope you can see it, actually. Uh, I am taking out the labels column and get out uh, what kind of values there are in the labels and how many there are of that specific label. And you know, uh, the this meaning is that uh, the two is the uh, okay uh, medium risk of damage, the one is the low risk of damage, and the three is the high risk of damage. But the problem here that uh, this data is very visible, that is very unbalanced. So if we pass the data like this to our machine learning model, it will maybe learn the number two better than the other two numbers. And then for a building that is uh, maybe actually it would have a high risk of damage, it would still return only medium risk of damage because that what, uh, that, uh, that's, the num that's the label it got more examples of. We really need to deal with this later. I'm going to show you a trick what you can do with this. The field of statistics is often misunderstood, um, but it plays an essential role in our everyday lives because statistics, if it's done well, uh, it gives you the meaning of the big, difficult real life. And a clear understanding of statistics uh, is gives you gives you a statistical measures that is important uh, when you want to distinguish between truth and uh, misdirection. And when we have a set of observation, it is useful to summarize the features into a, a statement, into a single statement. It is called descriptive statistics. And as their name suggests, descriptive statistics describe the quality of the data. They summarize and it is very useful, especially when you have like 200,000 rows to look through. Instead of uh, scrolling it through, you can just get the details by running this beautiful Python describe function. And what we can see here is the first uh, in the first row. This is showing how many uh, not new null values we have in our data set. And uh, I can assure you that we don't have nulls in the data set. That's not going to be the biggest problem in this data, luckily. But imagine if it uh, would be nulls in it. The problem with the uh, nulls is that um, in the end, uh, the calculations are uh, not going to be that well in the end of the story. Like, let me give you a very, very bad example, but this is the easiest to explain like this. So, for example, if you want to give back the average of the numbers uh, from one to three, then you could return uh, the average is two. But what if there is a null in the list as well? So it's going from zero to three. Then the result will be something very different and it won't be a rounded number and it is ugly and we don't like to uh, count with such numbers actually. So it is always nice to, to do something about the nulls. But luckily, we don't have to deal with it at the moment. Another important observation, if you look at these has underscore columns there, and um, if you are looking at the minimum and the maximum. So let's say it is uh, 0 and 1, right? And these might be 
the false and true actually, but I cannot be sure about it, but there is a way to check this out. And uh, that is mm, not here. <laughs> there we go. So the has, has underscore uh, column, most of the, and actually all of them, I checked it one by one, <laughs> but these ones have only one and zero uh, in their columns. So we can say that, okay, this column is, uh, is a categorical column, so we have to deal with this uh, as well. It is interesting to to make sure that we that we know what we have to transform when we get to training. What I also wanted to show uh, here is that uh, when we look at the age column here, that the minimum is zero and the max maximum is 995, which is okay. I mean, we might have some other buildings in the in the story, but if we look at the the box plot here, we can see that this is the mean of the age column. So you know the average of the whole column, and most of the buildings are very close to this mean. It's between like zero and 200 years, but there are some outlier values. This might be, you know, a memorial building or something. Like most of the tutorials would say to throw that out. We don't need that. It's really just giving some noise. That's not going to be true. We are going to keep these values as well in, and I'm going to show you how to fix uh, such problems as an outlier value. Um, also, keep it in mind that we have 31 columns here. It is because the Python's describe function it only returns the numerical columns and it throws out the ones that is, uh, for example, having string in the columns. And this uh, gives me a good idea that we have like eight columns that is uh, including a string data in it. So let me show you uh, some investigation how one of the string, uh, string uh, columns look like. It shows me that there are like three different values in it and it has this many uh, of these values. Now, you could assume that, okay, this could be also a categorical value and all that, but uh, I uh, don't really uh, encourage uh, anyone to change a string to a numerical value just to make it categorical, because uh, if the customer gives you more data and then you suddenly have five categories not free, then it is uh, maybe giving way too much noise instead of giving an actual uh, good information to our predictions. So, when we prepare for the work with a predictive model, we should already have a good understanding of the features we want to keep and the ones we want to leave out. And for now, we can conclude the information we learned with the statistics and some investigations and keep that in mind that uh, I was only showing now examples, but I investigated each of the columns before I have taken the data set into my experiment. So, uh, right now, when we move to the next step, I would like you to just believe me a bit. <laughs> so what we're going to do is to go to the next step, is to start up the designer. And the good thing about the designer, it is pretty much the same like we have seen before in the Azure Machine Learning Studio. And I have prepared for you an experiment already, and I and I on purpose don't want to show the rest of the experiment because it's huge and it might scare you away. But what we can do, first of all, is uh, to create a new experiment. And uh, if you take a look at the panel over here, uh, you might have seen this also before. You can choose a data set from here and then you can choose the different algorithms from there. And there are a lot of modules that is very useful when you want to build a predictive machine learning model. So before going through this experiment, just as a reminder and a recap from the previous step, we have a good understanding of our data and it is now clear what we have to do. So the first thing we had to deal with that we had unbalanced data and we had unbalanced uh, values for each labels. Then we had some non-numerical uh, columns that we might have to exclude. And then we yeah. also have outlier values that we have to deal with. So I just want to show you first that uh, how our data set looks like. And, uh, and as you can see, it is uh, the uh, Microsoft's uh, preview version still, and they are working very hard on it to make it pretty. But uh, this is uh, how it looks at the moment, and it is easy to use, actually. I wanted to show you how skewed our data is, actually. 
So, for example, this is the damage grade one, this is the damage grade two, and the damage grade three. And what we can see is that from the damage grade two, we have way too much data here. And if we pass this to our model, it might be able to predict uh, so, uh, stuff with a good accuracy, but most of the time it would return two. Because that's what it got a uh, lot of ex uh, examples from. All right. So during the that, uh, sorry during this uh, statistics part, uh, we have observed that uh, there were some uh, some columns that are not including uh, numerical values. And what we can do is just simply exclude those. For this, you can use uh, the select columns uh, in dataset. And uh, if you go to this edit column part, you can define which columns you want to include and which ones you don't want to include. And you can do it with rules or by name. And uh, it is really cool that you can choose from, from different aspects of how do you want to choose these column names. But we just go with the settings like this. And in this way, we now only have uh, numerical data. But if you remember, we also had some categorical data that should be handled. And that can be done with the edit metadata model. And all these modules can be found here with actually just writing in like this, then it is returning that. And, uh, and then you just pull it in and just ready to use. So how do you set up an edit metadata? Again, the same uh, column editor. So you just go and uh, choose your columns that you want to change. And remember, I told you that it has underscore columns having only zeros and ones in the in there as a data there. So I'm just going to have all the has underscore columns and change it to categorical values. Another important step of uh, data preparation is something called normalization. This is uh, we are going to use to exclude the outlier values we have uh, talked about before. And the goal of normalization is actually to change the values of the numerical columns in the data set uh, to use a common scale and uh, without distorting the differences, actually. And it is because if you have uh, noticed it, we had like uh, different uh, data about these buildings, uh, such as the age, the area, the height. And uh, for example, the age is in years, the area is in uh, square meters and so on. It is having a lot of different scales. So what we want to do is to do some normalization and uh, accept the damage grade we are going to apply this z-score method. So how the z-score works, for this I actually made a slide, so I can show you how does it look. So uh, the z-score uses the mean and the standard deviation for calculating each values. It takes the value and decreases it with the mean of it, and then it divides with the standard deviation of it. And by this, it is going to return uh, uh, numbers in a range instead of uh, keeping outlier values. All the columns will be in the, in the same scale in the end. And uh, just a kind reminder, you can only apply it on numerical data. So you have to exclude the categorical uh, values that we have set to 0 and 1 and also needs to exclude uh, the damage grade. It is because the damage grade should stay how it is, uh, because that's what we are going to use as a label column when we want to predict. The challenge of working with imbalanced data sets is uh, in most machine learning techniques is ignored and in turn have a very poor performance. Although typically the performance on the minority class is also very important. Just like in our case, the minority classes are the one and the three. Either it is low uh, risk of damage or very high risk of damage. So it really needs to be included. So one approach is to addressing imbalanced data sets to oversample the minority class. And the simplest approach involves duplicating examples in the minority class, but these examples don't add any new information uh, to the model, and instead, new examples can be synthesized from the existing uh, examples. And this is a type of uh, data augmentation uh, for the minority class, and it is referred to as 
synthetic minority oversampling technique. And it is called like this in the shorter version, SMOT. And now I'm going to show you around uh, what actually we are playing with right now, because it's really cool to look at, I think. So uh, now the normalized data looks crazy and it has like a zero point whatever and minus and whatever, like, like crazy numbers here. But we have a lot of uh, cool data there. And what I wanted to show you, it's like how was again the before and after pictures, you know. So this is uh, how the damage grade uh, frequency looks like before. And then before I explain it, I really want to show you this because it's pretty awesome and how it looks after. If it also wants to load it, yes, cool. And uh, okay, this is not that yet. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there, sorry, this one. So after the, the balancing, so after applying this uh, SMOT, this is how balanced the data is. It's much closer to each other, right? So it's pretty cool. So how does this work? What I was doing is uh, basically splitting up the data that we have been working with and uh, in, in the first version, we, was, we would have the damage grade under uh, three, and that would include the one and two. And that, then what I'm doing is that with the SMOT, -E, I'm comparing these two columns. And the first columns, so the number one, will be grown with uh, 400% compared to the two. And on the other side, I am splitting the data to include the bigger than one. Then it will compare it between the two and the three, right? And then after uh, making the change I define, then it is going to uh, get back the data. Why the split data is here? It's because now both sides include the, the, uh, the damage grade uh, label too. And it is important to not forget this because otherwise you make duplication of the labels for the for the label too. So that's not a good idea. And then what I do is just simply put the data together and then it is ready to work with. So now finally, with the split data model, we will have the data for training and for validating the model. And Right now, I set the fraction uh, to 0 0.7. This would mean that 70% uh, of the data will go for training and 30% will go for validation. And now it is time to train our models. For training, um, you can you know, choose uh, the best fitting algorithm. And you don't need to fully understand the mathematical functions behind these algorithms because Microsoft provides you a cheat sheet that you can use uh, to get started to make that decision. Um, and for this, I just jump back again to my slide because uh, there are uh, several uh, algorithms actually, but uh, the main uh, algorithms that are presented in uh, ML, uh, Azure ML is uh, are these three. So when a value is being predicted, for example, the car price is next year, the supervised learning is called regression. And the approach that uh, anomaly detection takes is to simply learn uh, what normal activity looks like and then and identify anything that is uh, significantly different. And when the data are being used to predict a category, supervised learning is uh, also called as classification. So in our case, now we need to define whether the building has high, low or medium risk of damage. This is can be uh, this can be you know the classification because now we have to define a category. So what we can do now and my mouse is moving now that uh, we start from here and now we want to predict categories and we have like one, two, three, so three or more categories. Then, then we get to the multi-class classification algorithms. And that's a, again a kind reminder that, uh, that there might be some differences between the classic uh, studio and the new one. But uh, 
I have chosen two of my favorites. And those are favorites because uh, with this data set, these two returned uh, with the best uh, results. But otherwise, if you come here, you can see that there are a lot of, lot of algorithms for you to choose from, actually. And from us now, the multi-class uh, classification models were interesting. So uh, I chose the neural networks and the boosted decision tree. So now that we are getting uh, very close to train our model, let me quickly explain you how these uh, work. So how these uh, algorithms could actually work. So a neural network is a set of interconnected layers. And uh, inputs are the first layer, that is maybe the yellow ones. And those are connected to an output layer by a cyclic graph. Um, and it has uh, weighted edges and nodes as well. The output uh, node in this case would be the pink uh, little uh, node there. And between the input and output layers, you can insert some hidden layers as well. That would be the blue and the green ones. And however, recent uh, research shows that uh, deep neural networks with many layers can be very effective in complex tasks, such as image or speech recognition. But uh, for some cases, uh, it is enough to just have like a, uh, maybe just a one or two or just a few hidden layers. The relationship between inputs and outputs is learned from the training the neural network on the input data. And the direction of the graph proceeds uh, from the input through the hidden layers uh, and to the output layer. And all nodes in a layer are connected by uh, the weighted edges uh, to, to nodes into the next layer. So to compute the output of the network for a particular input, a value is calculated at uh, each node. Uh, in, uh, so each node in the hidden layers and in the output layer. And then, so, the value is set by calculating this weighted sum of the values of the nodes from the previous layers. And an activation function is then applied. And that is how it is calculated. I'm not sure it made sense, but uh, yeah, we can, we can talk about this later as well, just more. And then let me talk a bit about the decision tree as well. Uh, this is one of a uh, predictive modeling approach as well used in the statistics actually. And um, it uses this uh, decision tree approach as a, uh, as a predictive model, and that goes from uh, an observation about an item represented in the branches to conclusion about an item's target value that represented in the leaves. And some techniques often called as uh, ensemble methods, and uh, they are constructed from more than one trees. And the boosted decision tree is one of these ensemble learning methods in which the second, free, uh, second tree corrects the errors of the first tree. And then the third one will um, correct the errors that is coming from the first and the second tree as well, and so forth. So predictions are based on the entire ensemble of trees together that makes the prediction. So generally, when uh, properly configured, uh, boosted decision trees are the easiest methods with uh, which to get help uh, with uh, to get uh, good uh, accuracy in the end. But it's also a very uh, memory intensive uh, method, so it might not be the best choice. But um, I chose to work with it, and then I also wanted to get a good. Uh, result. And if you remember, in the original uh, machine learning studio, if you use this two model hyperparameter, you also needed to train the model then. But the cool stuff about this, uh, when you want to tune the hyperparameters, that is meaning that uh, choosing the best uh, parameters for your model, uh, specifically for your data set, this module now also trains the model, so we don't have to have an uh, extra train model uh, module here. All right, so training is happening, and when the training is done, we can score the model. So what happens when we score is that, no, not sweep results, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Uh, it has all the sweep results, good, okay, then let's call it like that. Score module. It's funny, at first it's shown sweep results and then it's shown score results. Anyway, so what it shows us is that um, you can see here the uh, predicted values 
and a possible possibility for uh, for each damage uh, categories. And you can also see actually how balanced our uh, prediction result as well, like closely. It's pretty cool. <laughs> but it is visible that it is uh, not really working well. It is uh, still coming back with ones and twos most of the time. So and and you you know cannot just scroll through and and that does that does not tell you how your model works and that's when you can use the evaluate model module and that is going to show you uh, the results. No, okay. As I mentioned before, Microsoft is working very hard to put together this design correctly, and it's just sometimes it's not doing what I want. But as you can see, and, and again, this is also on the way of uh, working nicely, but in the in here it means that this is the neural networks result, and this is what the decision tree resulted here. So it has 75% of accuracy. That means that in 75% uh, of the time, it was able to, um, to um, you know, predict the label correctly. And I don't think that is already available. No, it's not. Um, yeah, I will show you that later then. All right, but let's say we are uh, happy with our model and I'm going to choose to work, uh, to continue to work with this uh, decision tree. And what I want to do now is when I get a new data set from my customer from Nepal, uh, I could predict them the labels for each buildings. So for this, for example, I have uh, test values that is also coming from Nepal. And these buildings are the ones that are still standing. So these are not collapsed yet. And, uh, but it has the same uh, columns. It st still has, you know, like for example, how many floors and age and all of that. So all this information is the exact same like we have trained the model of it which means that we have to apply the same transformation on this data set as well. Take out the non-numerical values, set up if the value is categorical. And then we can uh, send, uh, we can just uh, get out the data from it. And what happens here is, I know it's a chaos, but I should make it a bit smaller so it's somewhat more visible. So what happens here, uh, like uh, this one, yeah, so just ignore that. I don't know why is it like this. So yeah, so normalize the data as well. There we go. So we normalize the data as well because we want to have a similar kind of data for scoring as well. And here the, t uh, the trained model is going to be connected with my data and get a prediction based on this information. And if we visualize this, this will return the same uh, information like it did for the training data set. It will show the probabilities for each uh, categories and then show the scored labels. And it is uh, interesting that it, uh, it uh, predicts only low and very high uh, risk of damage for the buildings. But that's fine. That might be the data set like that. Um, so let's say now we want to also uh, send and hand over the report to our uh, uh, customers. So what we want to do is that uh, I put together that to have the ID and, uh, and the damage grade only for these buildings. So what I'm going to do is that I'm just uh, putting together a very simple CSV file in the end using the edit metadata to overwrite the names of the columns. So it will include the building ID and uh, whether it is having high or low risk of damage. And then this module here will generate the output for us, which now is only available if you want to download it from here. There's the result data set and you can just go with download. And if we open it up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so you you could open this up with uh, as a simple CSV reader, and that would look like. I want to visualize it. 
So yeah, so it will look like this. It has a building ID and the labels for it. So when the customer looks at it, uh, they can tell, okay, then this building definitely needs some uh, work on it because it might collapse at the next earthquake. So this is how you could use the designer for such a matter. But uh, there is one more thing I would like to show you. Um, and for this, we are going to go and try out the automated machine learning. Uh, what you can do here is uh, to go and create a new automated machine learning run. And then you can just uh, choose a data set or you can upload one, a new one, and then just go next. And then you want to define whether you want to create a new experiment or use the one that you have uh, generated before already. But now we would go with the new one because we want to make a new test in here. And the, the, uh, the, the column that we want to predict with is the damage grade again. And for a training cluster, we want to choose uh, one of a uh, cluster that you can actually create in uh, your portal. If you click here, you can also create one. You choose the name here. And it is funny when I'm saying that, oh yeah, you have to create it in the portal. Yeah, it was like that before actually. <laughs> anyway, now you can create it inside here. That's awesome. And we can just go next. And since we are trying to figure out what is the category of uh, the building, so the damage grade category, you want to choose the classification. And we can just go, sure, why not use the deep learning as well? It's, uh, it's just uh, providing you some uh, deep network like I just showed you, for example, for the neural networks. And if you click finish, then it starts running. I won't start it up because it uh, runs for a while. I can tell you how long did it run. It runs for 47 minutes. And, uh, but when you're done with running it, what this is doing is that it is trying out different models that, is, that might fit your problem, actually. And by like some, I mean like a lot of, lot of models you can try out and you can, it, you can see what is the accuracy that it returned with. And if you have a favorite model you want to use because that had uh, one of the best accuracy, for example, this one. You can just go and, and uh, do some uh, visualizations as well. How did it actually work? And this is where I wanted to go to uh, something, one of my favorite visualization that I really like, because that is the really good explanation, I think is the something called the confusion matrix. And I really like the name of it as well. It is telling you how confused your uh, machine is. So for example, this means that this is uh, what the machine is predicted, the one, two, three, and this is what actually it is. So in 12,000 times of the cases, uh, it predicted correctly that it is a, a medium risk of damage. And then in 5,000 times, it was able to predict that it was actually free. Uh, so it's high risk of damage and so on. But 25 times it predicted that it is high risk of damage and it is actually very low. And on the other way around in 45, 46 cases. But this result is, uh, well, it is getting closer to, to what, uh, would, what you would expect that it is a good result. So what you can also do here is that you either can deploy this model and just let it go and let it run, or you can download it to work forward with it and uh, make, you make your own code in your own favorite environment and make some changes and, and uh, maybe improve it a bit. And I don't think this will work yet. No, not yet. Um, this is uh, going to show the details of your model at some point. How does it work? Maybe how does it make some decisions and all that? You can also review all the logs, uh, some output information that is not that interesting yet, but, uh, but this could be a good place to find some issues if there is any. And this is the project output that uh, you would actually download. All right, so I think this is all from uh, the demo right now. So uh, I just uh, would uh, like to tell you a bit about uh, where you can get started. The first thing is bringing you to the Azure Machine Learning Workspace uh, Microsoft documentations. 
And I mentioned, you know, these uh, pricing things uh, that you can find on the second link. And again, this project can be found, uh, not the whole project I showed you now, but uh, some of the aspects is, uh, are already there. You can find it on my blog, uh, codewitheve.azurewebsites.net. And uh, I just want uh, just a nice reminder again, uh, AI can be used for a lot of cool stuff and also for saving more lives. And if you get started, uh, Azure Machine Learning Studio is maybe the best choice to get started, where you can learn how your model is working, uh, how, how the algorithms are processing the data, and uh, you can see every steps one by one, what is the result. And it's, I think it's a really good place to get started and, and learn how to, how to use and, and uh, save more lives with AI, because you can also do it. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Eva. So I will stop the recording now.